not only distinguished, but as a whole, our symbol in all over the world. She is here already starting. I heard about 14 hours ago. And then I thought the that time we must have her in our, in our ATM Bangla studio to get a few moments with her. I thank uh, the editor of Bangla Pottika Tahir and Mr. Kausar Nabil to have her here so easily. I never thought a member of the parliament, British parliament, I would have here within a few hours. Anyway, we are not going to take that long time in here to hear something from her and our fellow citizen, those who are very anxious to talk about some personal question some political question, situation of Bangladesh, about the British politics and democracy. To hear all of these things, you are thinking this moment is going to be so long. I don't think so. She's a well-spoken person. So far we heard about her and we hear in the television and so many other places. Whatever you wanted to know, you can ask her by open mind, because it is a free country. We have so many obstacles, so many hard time we get in our country to get some real answer from politician. But I think and I hope she is going to answer us our all the questions from her heart. Now, I first uh, would like to introduce ourselves. First of all, my name is Fakhrul Alam. Yeah, please come in. I will not give you take a man, so I will tell you the chair. Take a chair in front of us, and I'm requesting you, member of the British Parliament, Roshanara, Miss Roshanara Ali, to come in our studio and take a chair in our stage. Please, Miss. Now I would like to introduce uh, ourselves. First of all, as a 
as you know, I spoke about it. Oh, a few moments ago, I spoke about ourselves, uh, who we are. We are two broadcasting companies here. One is ATN Bangla, another is ATN Bangla News. So, uh, ATN Bangla and ATN Bangla News, owned, owned by Chairman Mahfuz Rahman, Dr. Mahfuz Rahman, and introduce uh, our ATN Bangla uh, colleagues, those who are available here. First of all, news editor, uh, for Pete Seven, uh, I'll be first to come here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have ATN Bangla News, and we don't have so many of our colleagues today we can introduce mm -hmm. here, but one of our best and good and like uh, of, our, of our colleague is here. His name is Darpon Kovid. So I'm requesting Mr. Darpon Kovid to come here. Please. There's the... We have some of our director. They are not present here. I am hoping any moment they will come here. Uh, one of our director, his name is Mr. Ponir Bhuya, and another, his name is Masum Muhammad Moshin, and <coughs> another one name is Kiron. I hope they are coming within a moment, and as soon as they come, I will introduce them to you. And this is the show by, this is the show we are running by us, these people. And um, I think you've got someone in the back us, who wants to join us. <laughs> from all of us, I'm thanking you again. And uh, the program today, it is not planned and it is not, I mean, talk out what we are going to do. So as you know, our people, they like to talk. They will talk. And you have to answer all of their questions mm -hmm. uh, if you like. I think and I hope we are going to do this. And next of the show, I am going to request our editor, news editor, Fokir Selim. He will introduce all of us and he will take the all questions. And our member of the parliament, British parliament, Roshanar Ali, she is going to answer all of this. <coughs> and um, I, on behalf of ATN Bangla, I would like to request everyone to introduce yourself. That is better then it will be more easier for us. So first of all, I request from Jinuhai, you go ahead. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jinuhai Rahman uh, I've been living in the USA about 25 years. And I'm uh, overseas community activist, I could say a uh, political activist, you know, uh, trying to help the community people as well. And I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And I wish that, you know, so many of us can follow the path of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's Roshanali here. Uh, we are proud of you to see here. My name is Sheikh Yazudin Batra. I'm a freelance uh, director of TV programs, varieties program. At this moment, I don't want to ask you questions because everybody will introduce it first, then we will go for question, I think. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, Chaudhuri Sarwar Hassan. I'm basically a physician, a gastroenterologist, mm -hmm. but I also have three newspapers. Uh, we are very proud of and and uh, all your activities. Thank, Thank you. you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Nawal Basali. I'm a uh, selected Vishwanath Upajala, um, uh, New Yorker Vishwanath uh, Shavitri's president. Ms. Roshanara Ali, hometown of Kiyalaka Lukavra. We are really proud of you, and I would like to thank Sahar's vice office, uh, Bangla Patrika's office. You know, we had a conference there, and we spent some time. So I wouldn't take that. So she will be there, and you know, you can, um, you know, you guys can join us. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to uh, speak 
a few things about Bangladeshi immigrants in America as well as in London. Uh, I would like to request uh, Our Excellency Ms. Roshan uh, Rai to speak about the immigrant community of Bangladesh and London. Thank you. Shall I, shall I stay seated? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay. Whatever is convenient. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I, okay. Thank you very much. Asalaamu yeah. Alaikum. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll stay seated because you've given me such a comfortable chair to sit on. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak uh, mainly in English because it comes more naturally. Apologies. But I'll try and um, speak some Bengali. <laughs> um, maybe when we get into question and answer, we'll, we'll try. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you very much for the warm welcome and the kind words that um, you've expressed. Uh, I've just come from another meeting um, uh, with Tahir Bhai and, and his, his delegation uh, with a number of other organizations. And I hope that I'll see you all there tomorrow if you're available. But please don't... Um, stop your gardening or weekend leisure activities on my account. But I, um, I really wanted to come to see you all um, a long time ago. Um, after I was elected, I was very aware of the um, affection and the warmth and um, uh, sense of solidarity that I felt from, uh, not just from people in my constituency, from the different backgrounds, including the Bangladeshi community, and also the Bangladeshi community around the UK, but I was very aware of it um, in other countries. And America was very much at the forefront because I received many kind invitations to come to New York uh, to your events. Um, and I wasn't able to come straight away. Uh, so this is my first visit to the US uh, after the election. And um, I wasn't going to come for a work visit to the US and not um, have a bit of a homecoming with you all, with the Bangladeshi community. So I just want to say a big thank you for you giving up your time uh, on a Saturday um, afternoon um, uh, on your day off to meet with me and I'm aware that it was quite short notice so thank you very much and the second thing I want to say is that it meant a lot to me to have your support uh, from here uh, and also in other countries where the Bangladeshi community is, is you know based uh, because as many of you will know um, uh, it, it was quite a big challenge um, going into frontline politics. Uh, so it was really, really good to know that there were people around the world from our communities who were, who were there, who were encouraging me. Um, and I got that message from you, even though I didn't meet you until today. I did get that message because it was coming through from your families, from your friends who are in London, in the UK. Um, and in fact, what happened was lots of people in my constituency were saying, my relative from, you know, New York, or my relative from, who's based in, um, in, in, in Amsterdam, or my relative in Paris, and they would say, they told me to vote for you. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's reinforcing having that support. So anyway, thank you. Big thank you to, to you all um, for your encouragement and your support. And um, I, hope that, I hope that what I can do um, in my small way is to, to try and make sure that I use my position, um, having got elected to the UK Parliament, that I can use it in some way to try and make sure that the, uh, the Bangladeshi communities around the world but obviously, especially in the UK, have a voice in national politics and national life, public life, in my country. But I also hope, and I've been trying to do this, um, that I can make sure that the UK government does what it can to support Bangladesh and support the people of Bangladesh. Um, and as someone who recently got elected and then appointed to the shadow ministerial team for international development, um, I've been trying to do that 
uh, by speaking in the Houses of Parliament, by holding our government to account to make sure that they provide support to Bangladesh through development aid, but also through doing more trade to, in terms of investment, um, in terms of helping to uh, encourage growth in countries like Bangladesh. And that's why I'm here in the US um, as part of the shadow ministerial team uh, and have a program of events this week to meet the various multilateral agencies uh, such as um, the UN and, and IMF and World Bank and others to make sure that the British government, uh, sorry, the British um, government's activities on international development although my party is no longer in power, sadly, that the British government continues to make sure that it provides the support um, to developing countries that is appropriate and necessary, uh, and that our commitment and our investment in developing countries does genuinely help development, um, doesn't do any harm to those countries, but also that in, uh, in time those countries can thrive and prosper. And I'm really proud of the fact that the Labour government, when it was in power, did lead the way on international development. When I was a researcher in Parliament, um, working for a Labour MP, at that time Bangladesh received about 45 or so million pounds of aid from the UK. It now receives 250 million. Uh, and so in terms of investment, there's more funding going into countries like Bangladesh. But I'm really keen that Bangladesh receives support for climate finance to deal with adaptation and preparing for the ensuing challenges that are going to come up with climate change. Um, and that's where America and other major donors play a huge part. And that's where you come in, because you are the electorate here in the US. If you lobby your politicians, your senators, your congressmen, and so on, uh, and you tell them that they need to help Bangladesh to cope with climate change, then that's going to have more impact than, frankly, um, you know, Brits asking the Americans to do something. Because you are the electorate, and also you are in a very powerful country. So your voice and is much, much more significant, actually, than our voice as the Bangladeshi community in Britain. Because you are in a sup you know, the country that is still the superpower. It might not be for long, so you need to hurry up and, and make sure you, you get... Um, you know, you get your um, you get your voices heard in the American system. Um, so, so I I'm here for a number of reasons in the shadow ministerial capacity. Um, very mindful of what's happening in uh, uh, in, in countries like Bangladesh, but also in North a in North Africa and and the Middle East. Um, uh, and uh, here to learn, um, here to listen to you and what you have to say, what the concerns are from you, um, uh, and also to share some of the things that are happening in Britain, in the Bangladeshi community in Britain. Uh, so, you know, I hope that we can have a, maybe I could take questions and we can have a dialogue rather than me speaking for, for much longer. Um, but as I say, um, it, it is really wonderful to be here and to have the kind of warmth and affection uh, that you're showing. Um, uh, I'm going to make the most of it because politicians, um, you know, rapidly become unpopular uh, after a while if they're if they're in in their jobs for too long. So um, uh, so I'm you know I'm really thankful to you. I don't think there are many politicians um, of any you know it, you know it, of any party that experiences the kind of welcome and hospitality and uh, support that I I get not just in my own country but wherever I go um, f whether it's bumping into uh, someone in the Paris metro um, you know and who'll sit next to me it was uh, it was a very nice example you know somebody from from Bangladesh and he said oh what are you doing here please come to my house my wife will want to meet you you must come and have lunch and it's like meeting family everywhere in the world um, and the same happens in New York you know um, so uh, it, it's quite a it's quite a special thing and I know I'm really lucky um, uh, in having the privilege uh, and the opportunity to have become elected in Britain. And by, by implication, as a first, um, I'm really conscious of my responsibility um, uh, to um, our communities, um, not just in my country, but, 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 but elsewhere. I'm just conscious of how fortunate I am. And I am just 
incredibly, incredibly humbled by the re reception and welcome and warmth that I've had from you and, and many others. Uh, and I hope that we can stay in touch and that, that in years to come, um, when I come to New York, I've already started doing that. I'll just sort of shout and say I'm here and, you know, it will be, it will be like visiting family. Um, it is quite like that, I know. Um, so um, it's really nice and, and thank you very much. And I'll try and answer questions in Bangla. <laughs> I think there may be a role that you can play for that. A number two question I have that India, as you know, has been shooting our citizens. Especially there was an incident about this woman named Shilani who was shot, raped and killed. So the aim is that you know, if you can help us bring the criminal to justice, I understand the whole uh, organization may not be criminal, but the, whoever is responsible, maybe you can bring that person to the international court and if you can help in that. And my third thing is actually for the people of Bangladesh, a lot of them want to go to England, so since British and the Bangladesh is a part of a commonwealth, part of the commonwealth countries. If you can encourage to have a no visa requirement for all the Bangladesh, <coughs> for all the commonwealth countries. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I didn't realize I had a mic, I forgot. Yeah. Meantime, I would like to introduce uh, one of our distinguished guests. He is Mr. Moshe Dalu. He is a mainstream politician in New York. Sorry. Hello. And uh, I would like to request you all to please uh, make it short due to our guests time shortening sure. uh, please make one question everybody thank you i don't need it you can give it to okay. me it's okay i, I got hmm? Just put put the camera. Camera. oh sorry <laughs> fine do you want me to use yes. this okay well i mean i um the, the specific example case you've mentioned, if you, I'd be very happy if you could send me more information about it because um, I'm not aware of the details of the, men, uh, the, the example, you, the, the question about India uh, and the killings. Um, so if you could, then, then I, can, uh, I can look at that and refer it to, um, obviously, is a national issue, but if there are some wider issues that are relevant to that, that are appropriate for um, for us to pick up um, in the UK, then I'm very happy to look at that. Um, the second question about um, sorry, your first question was extrajudicial killings. Again, um, uh, we, you know, if there are particular cases and there's evidence on that, then um, you know that would be of interest. Um, there are obviously concerns about some of the reports that have been that have come through through WikiLeaks and so on, um, um, uh, and also some issues about human rights violations. Uh, so, if you if you can let us know. But obviously, what I would encourage you to do is also lobby your governments here and your politicians. Um, because uh, you know they have a they have a big role to play here, and at our end, you know if there are if there are if there are issues um, and if there's more evidence and more information that you could send send me, I'd be happy to pass I, at the very least to um, uh, take it up with our foreign office, for instance, or foreign secretary. But as I say, I don't know enough about the details, so I can't tell you what kind of action. I can take at this stage. Um, and the final one, you're about visa requirements. Um, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Um, every country has to, um, you know, whether it's a Bangladesh or a Britain or America, has to have uh, a policy, appropriate policy on immigration. Um, there are obviously political differences. You know, the Labour Party was the party that introduced primary immigration. Um, so the Labour Party has been more. Um, uh, more open in terms of its attitude to immigration in Britain. Um, so in the 1960s, uh, they encouraged people to go there to work. That's, that's how far my, my father went to the UK. Um, but there have been subsequent attempts to try and restrict immigration, especially, you know, because of the, the reality that if you open borders to common, the common, Commonwealth, well, that's, that's not going to work. That's not practical. Um, but what we um, 
what we did when we were in power until last year is two things. One is we, uh, we allowed people to go to the UK from lots of countries where they had skills that we needed. Um, you could say that's quite self-interested, but you know, the, the economy required um, people uh, you know, uh, that, that had skills. Um, so they went from India, they went from Bangladesh and many other countries and we needed nurses and we needed doctors because actually the Conservative government had not put enough money into training doctors and nurses. So when we came into power in 97, we put in billions of pounds into the NHS, but we didn't need the nurses and the staff. So we, we did encourage people to come and work in Britain when we had a boom. And now we have a, a, a recession, so it's much harder to be able to attract people. There aren't as good reason to encourage people to come. Um, and the other thing is that we, we also allowed people to work, um, low-skilled people, Traditionally, in, you know, in Canada, in Britain, elsewhere, if you have high skills, you could go in. Um, we also allowed people with lower skills uh, so to work in the restaurants because the restaurant industry had, doesn't have the... Um, we're not attracting many workers um, to, to meet the labour shortage. So that gave the opportunity to a lot of people from Bangladesh to go and work in the UK. Um, but the economy is now contracted, so there isn't as clear a need. Um, and there also have been abuses in the system, let's be frank. There were people who, um, you know, who, who went to the UK to work um, and some of the, uh, not everybody, but some people abused that system. So they charged Bangladeshis who were going to work in the restaurants. They charged them money for visas that they shouldn't be charging because actually it was to go and work there. So there have been um, people who were middlemen and women who exploited the system. So, you know, you have to be sensible about how you do that because otherwise what happens is the right wing comes into power and they become very anti-immigration and they say the, lab the left has been too, too free on immigration so we're now going to stop everybody from coming, which is kind of what they've done. They've said new con uh, Commonwealth migrants can't go to work, um, uh, they have to be from the EU and they've set a limit on the numbers, which is quite unrealistic and it's not healthy for the British economy, but that's what they're doing. So the immigration debate is complicated, I'm sure it is here as well. Um, but but we, we did, when we were in power, we did try to have a sensible policy that was reasonably open and pragmatic um, uh, uh, and, and fair, fairer than it had been in the past. Um, this government, the Conservative government, have come in and they've stopped students from coming which I think is uh, unhelpful for our universities because they can attract billions of pounds in from foreign students. Um, it's not that helpful for the economy. It's not that helpful for future relations between these countries where when you study in a country, you're more likely to have closer affinities when in years to come. And you're more likely to do business with that country and so on. So from, from the British interest, it's not that helpful that they're, they're trying to reduce the number of students. So I think they're going to have to rethink it. But it's not a good time because the, the new Conservative government, which is in coalition with the Liberals, is historically anti-immigration and historically quite hostile to ethnic minorities. And in a way, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not being very progressive. I didn't expect them to, but they're not being particularly... Um, you know, uh, friendly to your your idea, uh, but I don't think any government could have no visa requirement policy in any country. Very easily. Only for journalists. Only for journalists. Well, welcome to Thank your you. ranking honourable member of British Parliament. Thank you very much. It's a great occasion for us. I would like to say that perhaps you are the first uh, uh, Bangladeshi to the best of my knowledge uh, to have become a member of British Parliament. And the first one was the Dabai Nauruji in the 1880s, perhaps. Uh, in any case, so what I wanted to know from you is you seem to be a very young uh, person, and how was it possible for you to break into the British system? And I mean, there are many Bangladeshis, uh, perhaps millions of people there, but still it must have been very difficult, especially we know that uh, the BNP, British Nationalist Party, and other racist uh, groups, they have risen there over the last few decades. And because of them, 
but to break into mainstream politics have become extremely difficult, even within that context that you have been able to become a member of British Parliament is, uh, is incredibly um, a powerful statement to people all over the world. Uh, I know Ayan Hashivali became a member of perhaps uh, uh, um, one Parliament and later for some technical reasons she had to resign. But in any case, what uh, in, uh, important thing here for us, Mr. Moshe Dhamma, yeah. Uh, he is also a mainstream politician, but he couldn't go far. In America, the only recent perhaps there is a Bangladeshi gentleman who became member of the lower house of the uh, U.S. Congress, which is called House of Representatives. So your experience, if you okay. can yep. give us some brief idea, and our media can cover it, will mm -hmm. be a very important okay. uh, for teaching for um, people who want to be in mainstream politics, especially people. Sure. Comparatively, of course, the people from Bangladesh and South Asia have been very recent immigrants to the United States. Compared to Britain, they, they have been there for uh, centuries. So your experience, please. Can I take a few uh, together? Can yeah, I have two yeah, or three yeah. questions? Move. I think it's better if the journalist first make the question. Okay. Sure. Then that's okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, and welcome. Thank you. Recently, the British government uh, minimized the facilities of foreign students and decreased the number of admission and raised the tuition fees. Uh, as a result, a lot of Bangladeshi students are facing problems here. So I don't know, did you raise any issue or you have any plan to raise, any, uh, raise this issue in British Parliament? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roshnara uh, Ali I have a very short question. Uh, what are the main obstacles you are experiencing not to prosper in Bangladesh? Is the Sorry, so could you say What are the main problems you are watching not to prosper in Bangladesh? Uh, and number two is, could you tell us a little bit about, I know that you have a very nice relationship with Ed Miliband. Can you tell us about a little bit? Because we saw last year that you are working together with Ed Miliband and we know, uh, we like to share with you. Thank you so much. Sure. My name is Dr. Khan. I'm basically a teacher back from Bangladesh. I was a professor at Dhaka University and also I've been teaching for a long time. And I deal with the young generation. My question is that one of the biggest problems in America we are facing is there were a lot of American citizens, I mean, who are from Bangladesh, but it's very hard for them, uh, for us to convince them to go to the voting center and cast their votes. This is a, this has been a big problem. And also another problem is the accent problem. I mean, a lot of people here don't understand our people's accent. So these are the issues and also other issues we have. So do you have any suggestions for uh, the voters here and for the people who are ambitious, especially our future generation, how we, you can motivate them and how they can overcome the problems of all these things and make sure that their relatives and friends come to the voting center and campaign for them. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abu and uh, you know, my question is, uh, since September 11th, there is a backlash and many things happening uh, in United States and Europe also and in England also. And there is the issue right now about the home-growing terrorism and terrorists. Uh, in United States uh, Congress, there, is a, there was a hearing about home-growing terrorism yep. and it was it's been criticized by many people and supported by also many Americans. Uh, in Britain, uh, recently we found there is some incident happening related with terrorism. Uh, could you please tell us how 
first of all, what do you think about that all the um, allegation? And number two, uh, um, how we can uh, address this issue towards the Indonesia? Okay. Uh, I have a very simple question. That is, that now we have the history of Bangladesh. Your name is now in the history of not only UK, also in Bangladesh. What kind of mission, I mean vision, you have for Bangladesh so that you can keep your name as historical? Thank you. And okay. I want to know how Bangladeshis are doing in England. Yeah. And if you have any special plan about Bangladesh, like as a British MP, if you want to do something for the country you come from. Thank you. Okay, I'll, t I'll take those now. I'll, t I'll take some. Thank you. Right, there are some fantastic, fantastic questions. Um, and actually, I could, I could be here all night discussing them with you because they're so important, so really important sister questions. Um, I I'll, go, I'll start from the last first. Um, I think the question about, uh, well, what, what, do I, what can I do? What would I like to see Bangladesh um, uh, do in years to come? Um, I think it. I think it would be. It would be quite. It would be quite. Um, you know. I. I don't. I think all we can do is try. All we can do is play our part. Um, but I hope that what we, I don't, I can't say I on my own because I don't think any politician can act alone. You have to act with your communities, with your supporters, with the people in your country and you have to build alliances. So I think for Bangladesh what we need to do is we need to make sure that it can make the most of the economic opportunities that are coming over the coming decades. And I would say the places that Bangladesh should be looking at is China and India. China is just rapidly growing. It has proven, uh, to, proven its ability to reduce poverty you know, from 60-70% only two decades ago, something like that, to about 20%. That is profound, if you think about it. Whatever its failings might be in terms of not being a democratic society and so on, that's, a, that's another story. But if you look at its economic situation, it's done incredibly well. And in terms of trading partners, it's China and India. They're the two countries that Bangladesh is, is, is well positioned to tap into and build those partnerships. So I think there's an issue about economic growth that, it, you know, as a country, we as foreign uh, foreign Bangladeshis who care passionately about it can do a lot to encourage and speak up for Bangladesh. Uh, if you're in business, you know, doing business with the country of origin uh, is important. So business and development, very important. I think the second thing is about encouraging Bangladesh as critical friends, um, whether in Britain or in America, to um, to strengthen its governance, strengthen its institutions. I happen to think that actually, if you take an example like Pakistan, for instance, you know, we are, as a, Bang as a country, Bangladesh is in a very different place. You know, considering how young a country it is, you know, Bangladesh doesn't have the kinds of challenges that Pakistan has, but it has other challenges. So we need to look at how we can support and in, in, invest in the country, whether it's through, you know, your aid support here from the US or the UK support. Uh, and I look at it from that lens, you know, because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm someone who left when I was seven. You know, it's not, it's my country, but it's not my country. You know, it, it's, they can quite rightly say, you know, what would you know? So it's very important that I'm someone who can help and who's supportive <laughs> and who can speak up um, for, for Bangladesh, but recognize that the people there are the ones who are going to shape the destiny of that country and shape the future of it. Uh, and what we should do is be there um, and to speak up and also make sure that the big challenges, whether it's on development and good governance, which is critical in any developing country, not just Bangladesh, that that happens. Um, and that our aid effort helps to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't undermine the efforts to achieve that. 
Uh, there's this, this, and by good governance, there's issues around corruption, which is not unique to Bangladesh. It's a problem for many countries, uh, um, and, and it's important to look at how that can be addressed. Uh, because if you want to invest in a country like that, you want to find it easy. If you're a businessman, you want, you're going to go to the country where it's most efficient. You're not, it's not going to cost you money um, to do business with that country. Uh, you're going to be able to make money, uh, and so on. So, so those things are going to be critical. And, and I think the other thing I hope we can do is aim, work towards work, uh, speaking um, up and raising awareness both in Bangladesh and in the international community about the fact that that is the country that's going to be suffering uh, uh, significantly because of climate change. You know, it's the country that's going to have millions and millions of refugees over the next two or three decades. Uh, and I don't think people are fully people fully appreciate that, whether in Bangladesh or here, um, or or in the UK and so on. Um, so we need to. I hope one of the things I can do with you all and others is to really heighten awareness that Bangladesh will need to get the appropriate funding and support to cope with the challenges that are going to come with climate change. Um, and so if there was a campaign, if you were asking me, is there a campaign that you want to be known for and associated with, um, that would be the one. Uh, because that is a long-term issue. This is something that whatever your political difference is, uh, unless you're a, you're a climate skeptic, you're going to be behind that campaign. So I feel that this is something that I want to make sure we can broaden support out uh, and I can work with you. Um, uh, so we have a platform which is about uh, making sure that the world is aware that Bangladesh is going to need serious help you know, over the coming, coming years. Uh, to cope with climate change, um, so that would those would, would be the key areas that I I I'm keen to focus on, and I'm really pleased that I have the opportunity to do that through my portfolio on international development. Uh, so, and then in terms of your question about how people are doing in, I think the question was how are people in my area in the UK are doing? Uh, it's a mixed picture. So the. Um, People are beginning to do better, more home ownership, more uh, business uh, community, um, uh, you know, more success in the big business community. But there's a big difference. I guess the Indian community, compared to this, if you look at just the subcontinent, the Indian community is the most advanced economically and so on in education. Um, and then you have the Pakistani community, which is on a similar power, I'd say, to, to the Bangladeshi community. Um, so what we've got to do is really look at where we can pull together. Um, so in, in politics, um, Pakistani community is doing pretty well now. So when I was elected, um, there were three other Pakistani origin politicians who elected the same time as me. I was the only Bengali. And just to share one example with you, um, one thing I really liked about the Pakistani community and business community and so on, some of the senior figures in the communities, they invited all of us to meet them um, and they, they were very sweet, the, um, many of the older senior business leaders from the community. There were Bangladeshis as well, but it was a more, domin more dominated by their community because they had a lot more candidates. You know, they had four Pakistani candidates and I was the only Bengali one. Um, and uh, they decided to fundraise, you know, to help us, um, uh, our, to help our campaign. And we all got up and gave speeches. And some of the Pakistani business leaders came up to me and said, you might be the only Bangladeshi candidate, but you were the best. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, which is very nice, you know, they, they, they were like, you know, um, uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, they were willing us on. So it's quite nice when people come together, you know, whatever your historic differences might be, um, and they take pride in, in the achievements of the younger generation. Um, so, but they have, they had two senior government ministers. Um, one of them lost his seat last time, who's a friend of mine, and another one, uh, another friend who is um, a minister, shadow minister for justice, who's doing very well and two women, Muslim women, Pakistani, who got elected with me. So they're doing better, but all the communities could do better. So in politics, we're behind, um, but I want to change that. So I'm trying to, um, by getting younger people to become councillors, because that's the route into power. You know, you've got to start from the local. Often that helps you to plug in and, and then get into parliamentary seats. Um, in education, women are doing better than the men. The girls are doing much, much better. 
Uh, so that's a worry. The girls, uh, it's a great source of pride and celebration that the girls are doing really well. And many of them are in professional jobs. Um, they are, you know, they're the breadwinners in the families quite often. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they're the ones that are helping their parents and uh, doing a lot. Um, the boys are doing less well in education um, compared to girls. Um, so what we're trying to do is really, uh, I mean, I'm being quite... Um, firm and telling parents that they really need to concentrate on the boys. And I think it's partly because parents think boys don't need to be, um, well, they think the boys can have, have freedom, more freedom than the girls, but actually um, if they have too much freedom, they're not doing their homework, they go out and they can get themselves into trouble, they can get into, you know, they can get into bad influences. So that can, that's part of the reason why they're not doing as well. And I think they're probably, I'd say, I don't know, you have a better idea, but I think parents are probably more, um, less strict with their boys, you know. Um, so I'm trying to encourage them to be more strict um, and encourage them to study harder. Uh, so those are the big challenges. And unemployment is a huge challenge, huge, huge issue, um, especially with the recession. Uh, so, you know, I, I developed my own training program to help unemployed graduates because we now have a lot of Bengali graduates. Um, huge numbers, but uh, in my constituency we have uh, the high, one of the highest unemployment rates for graduates. So that just makes me angry because, you know, what is the point of getting a degree if you can't get a job? So I develop my own project and I train them myself with other people uh, and then I try and get them into internships and training programs. Uh, some of them are working working in my office. When I can't find them a job anywhere else, I, I get them to, to do stuff in my office so that they can get some experience. Um, and then try and get, help them get into the professions in banking and, and, um, uh, and other sectors. And that's beginning to work, but it's only a small program and I want to see that expand so that we can get more of them into these. Uh, and, I, and I think you have to do practical things. Um, so those are the key points I, I thought I, I'd say um, about that. Somebody said, uh, somebody asked the question about voter participation. Um, I think, you know, one way to motivate people is try and get people of your own community, talented people, into politics. There's nothing that motivates our community more than I noticed myself then finding someone who looks like you, who can speak for you, who can speak with you um, and about you. Um, to, to motivate them to, to participate in politics. And I think the political parties have a lot to answer for, whether it's in America or Britain. They need to make sure that they seek out talent in different communities. And I was very pleased to meet a young um, politician um, in the, my last meeting who's won a seat in Michigan, um, uh, and he looks like he's about 12. You know, he's, he's, he's fantastic. Um, so, and very pleased to see another colleague here. Um, uh, I say colleague because politicians are, you know, fellow colleagues. Um, because you have to, you know, so you need your own candidates. So you can really rally behind them. But it's really important to do political education, to get the kids in the meetings, you know, try and organize public meetings where the teenagers and the students, your, your children or, you know, siblings, they can understand and they can go to community meetings. Because one of the problems in our, in the UK, I'm an Amrar Tower Hamlet Sonic meeting, public meeting, community meeting, uh, but younger generation, because um, I hope you don't mind me speaking Sileti, um, younger generation, because it's not very interesting. Uh, a language that I ta in uh, Bangla long speech, lampa speech. It's a tara bus to varen ashok kizu. To kono tara tara koi parents re onik shomai koi bo. Ami zai ami kano zai gele balak tonai because it's a boring. Uh, so similar maybe afnara selamai re ita foson to kor tonai. But ami mona kori zudin afnara ekto chesta koi an accessible banain. To kono tara dukia dekpo zai incredible onik kaz kor afnara. Afnara uh, their community organizing abilities at what com Obama does, you know, Afnara eta bo tak taki khorra. Kintu amra younger generation eta busta farana. I ami u butchina, ami bustam vartam na ze public meeting go, what, what happens, you know, hundreds of men like um, go and get together. But what do they do? They just talk. Erokum mana khortam. Tahon ami jahan selection of fash khora for it, jahan community meeting go dekha khorsi. Dekha khora, I was really humbled because I met people, incredible people, with incredible stories of struggle. 
you know, and I realized I, w I, I was only able to be doing what I was doing because of what they did. But our kids don't understand that because often we don't explain it. Our parents don't explain it because they're too busy doing the work and they forget to educate their children and make it accessible. So you're probably better at this than we are in the UK, um, but it's worth thinking about how you can get the younger generation integrated into your meetings uh, so that they can connect and they can understand what you're about and what you struggled for. Because otherwise what happens is the younger generation say, ah, oh, my dad's generation, they didn't do anything. Which is not fair. <laughs> uh, and I know that because I know you work very, very hard. Um, uh, and I often say to them, hang on a minute, did you have to put up with the racism that they did? Hang on a minute, did you have to do this, this and this? And then they go, ah, and I tell them stories. But it shouldn't have to be like that. It's more, much better if you can bring them in um, and if you can bring you know, the, the, your sons and daughters into those meetings um, and hear their stories and try and explain in a way that they understand. So then they can tell your story better and they can fight for you when they're in their institutions. Uh, so I think, I think participation is going to be about you connecting with, with a mix of communities, but also then looking at how to engage others. Um, then I think on the point about language and accents, um, you know, language classes are so important. Uh, so e I don't know if you've got funding here, um, support to train people to learn English uh, or American English. Um, uh, and I think, you know, there's nothing, th th there's not, I suppose that's where the younger generation can make a big difference. You know, st when they're at university or they're studying, they can teach those who can't speak. We're now in a position where our communities can help each other. We don't, you know, you don't have to go beyond um, the community. Uh, the younger generation have those skills. So how can they teach those who struggle? Um, uh, so it's worth looking within the resources that's without, within us uh, to, to do that. Uh, we, I don't know what it's like here, but we have English language support classes and so on. But the, the current government is cutting a lot of funding for that. So it's, it's an uphill ba battle. Um, the, um, there was another question about... Um, uh, foreign students, I, I think I touched on that, foreign students, I'm not very happy about the, the way that the new government, the Conservative government has um, decided to cap, put a limit on foreign students, um, but, uh, you know, they're in charge, we're not. Uh, my policy, uh, my party's policy was different, uh, and I can't really speak for the Conservative-led government. Uh, but if you have relatives in, in the UK and you want to tell them not to vote Conservative or Liberal, then please feel free to. <laughs> um, education and um, ed education cuts and higher education fees. Um, my party uh, spoke um, against the cuts. We voted against the cuts. I voted against the ha higher education fees. Um, and also the cuts in the education maintenance allowance. That is a really important grant that we gave uh, of up to £1,500 for 16 to 19 year olds. Um, because, and, and a lot of, uh, about 80% of Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, and other minority groups benefited from it because they come from lower incomes and this government has scrapped it. So each year, if you have one child, you lose about £1,500. That's a lot of money. If you've got two child, £3,000. That's, that's a lot. And it, it, you know, the reason why we introduced it was because we, um, we, sure. The, re the reason why we introduced it is because we wanted to encourage them to stay on at school and college so that they could then go on to higher education and it was working but this government has come in and scrapped it uh, but they haven't done anything about bankers bonuses they haven't uh, been you know uh, only recently you know hundreds of hundreds of millions of pounds were made by bankers for instance in bonuses and we introduced a bankers tax um, on bonuses and felt that that was fairer rather than punishing people who are not very wealthy um, for the mistakes of the banking industry, sections of the banking industry. But the, again, it's, it's a real challenge because this is a different government to the last Labour government. But we campaigned. I spoke in Parliament about it. Um, I went on a number of rallies and marches. We had a big one in, in May, sorry, in, in March, on March the 26th. Um, and, uh, you know, you can look up uh, on They Work For You, which is a website that has all my interventions in Parliament um, and the debates that I spoke at on education funding and so on. Um, the, um, 
obstacles to prosperity, I think I've answered about Bangladesh because I, I think it's about trade, it's about anti-corruption strategies, governance, it's also about national infrastructure, it's about electricity and roads. You know, if you've got a country that has functional systems and infrastructure, you're more likely to have people coming in and investing. And, and as I say, the country that's very good at that, doing that, is countries like China. Um, uh, and what I hope that we can do through our effort um, on international development is to encourage more investment on infrastructure as well as tackling poverty, which is absolutely right. Um, the question about 9-11, um, I think, you know, I, I think that... Yeah, 9-11 was incredibly, you know, we all know this. We know as, as Bengalis, we know as Muslims. 9-11 uh, was, if you're living in, in, in countries, whether it's America or Europe, post 9-11 was incredibly difficult for all of us. There's no getting away from that in terms of how it um, made us feel, um, how a group of terrorists hijacked, um, tried to hijack Islam, um, uh, and and exploit, you know, you t t give Islam a bad name, um, and the consequence in terms of civil liberties and so on. And and you will be well versed in all of that. And there are parallels in Britain in terms of the civil liberties agenda and how it was it was undermined and damaged. You know, ninety days. Um, uh, one of the policies that uh, uh, the Labour government introduced, which I was against, um, I feel was wrong because once you start to reduce. Um, people's civil rights, um, you diminish a society and you should always try and strike an appropriate balance be between security and liberty. Um, and there are many lessons to learn. But I, but I think we have to be absolutely clear that there are people who are terrorists who call themselves Muslims, but they're not Muslims. And the point is that it's not, you, you can't bury your ha heads, no one should bury their heads in the sand about that. And it has to be challenged. Um, so in many parts of my constituency, the mainstream majority of the Muslim community, of the Bengali and other Muslim communities, um, they feel that the people who go around saying intolerant things, who are extremists, who, are, um, uh, who use Islam, you know, uh, to justify things that cannot be justified should be challenged. And I think that our responsibility has always got to be about challenging those elements that do that. Um, and also challenging those, those who try and um, brand Islam with intolerance and terrorism. You know, and the right, whether it's here or in, in Britain, the ultra-right will try and do that. And it's our job to try and make sure that people understand um, that uh, Islam is a peaceful faith and that you know, terrorists should not be allowed to hijack that religion. Uh, and we all have a responsibility to do that, even in really difficult, challenging times. And I guess for me, one of the things I am very aware of is that um, sections of the media, there's always sections of the media, tries to um, demonize people of faith who, um, uh, in their eyes, look very conservative. Um, and I think it's really important, again, to educate them, to make sure that they don't label people uh, with suspicion and think of them in suspicion um, uh, and with prejudice. And so it's about, you know, all of us explaining to them and challenging that prejudice too. Because otherwise, what you end up with is people feeling that they're constantly treated with suspicion. And that cannot good, be good for any society. And it's certainly a huge problem if that happens to, to young people and young men. And, and, you know, in my constituency, there are young men who often get stopped and searched by the police. Um, and, and for no, no good reason. So it's about challenging that. And that's why we have to be robust in fighting for our civil liberties. But we also have to be robust in challenging extremist opinion and views where people try and hijack our faith. Um, I'm just going to wrap up quickly because...